Hello and welcome to today's Subta Power Hour. I am Michelle Lang, your Subta host. And today we have with us Paul Jarrett, who is the co-founder and CEO of Bulu Box. And he is here to help us talk about box personalization in your business and how we can really use data to help drive a deeper experience with our memberships. So Paul, welcome. Hello, how are you doing Michelle? We're doing great here in Michigan. How are you doing there in Nebraska? We are doing fantastic. It's just starting to get cold, so I uh, just broke out the coat today. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Everybody, welcome aboard to that. We're, we're there with you. So, Paul, I would actually like to turn this over to you because I know that's why people tuned in. And if you could share with us a little bit of what Bulu Box is up to, and then we'll dive into the, the content you want to share today. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks, Michelle. Um, hey, everybody out there. Um, I know in the past this has been, there's open and questions and Michelle, you can interrupt me uh, whenever you want or, or if something pops up. So I'm more than happy to take on the tough questions. So as Michelle mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bulu Box. My wife uh, and I, who she's actually our CMO and uh, um, COO actually, and co-founded the company with me, we started you know, probably around five or six years ago. And, uh, you know, the original idea was Birchbox for vitamins and supplements. We grew incredibly quickly. I, I, I'm embarrassed to share some of the numbers about our company because to be quite frank, it was easy back then. Um, you know, we were getting customers at, you know, 85 cents and they were worth hundreds of dollars. And anything that we do, whether it was post to a website or social media, we would just get subscribers left and right. So uh, that ended, you know, probably we grew to about 500K monthly recurring revenue, um, probably about 18 months to two years in, um, it started to get more challenging and more challenging. We had raised $6 million in capital and we just kind of took a big step back and tried to figure out what to do with the company moving forward. And so we decided to kind of answer, <laughs> it took a kind of outside third party to come in and tell me like, hey, um, everybody is contacting you from large retailers about subscription boxes. Um, and we know people have tried to acquire your business and the price hasn't kind of got to, to a point that you would sell at. Have you ever thought of servicing other companies? And immediately I was like, no way, that's all of our value. Um, you know, this is much harder than just getting paid to do something. And um, over time though, I will say I was, uh, came to see the light of working with partners. So not only now do we have bulubox.com, uh, which does vitamin supplements. We say, again, like Birchbox for vitamins and supplements. Uh, but also we do subscription box, um, both consulting, uh, shipping, fulfillment. We basically say we find, facilitate, and fulfill subscription boxes for other companies. And we have a focus on some larger retail companies, but we do have some other kind of mid or smaller people layered in depending on the le le uh, kind of level of work. So the majority of our business is now this turnkey subscription box solution. So in this presentation, I am not allowed to share our clients or their kind of specific numbers. But I can say that we're on track to do 5 million boxes uh, next year to ship as both for clients and for Bulu Box. The vast majority of those are going to be for our clients. Um, Bulu Box is not the largest part of our business anymore. Uh, but I will say I can speak in broad terms to our clients. And I think that's the value that um, I will bring to this presentation is kind of saying, well, for Bulu Box, we did this. And for our clients, this is what we see. Um, and I would love to have questions in between and, and I won't be shy on uh, what I feel comfortable answering and what I don't feel comfortable asking. asking. So, that's so first off, Paul, yeah. first off, thank you so much for walking us through how you have evolved your business model. I think a lot of companies in the subscription space, we start off with one idea and concept and the ones who stick around and are successful are those who see where to evolve and adapt next, particularly with their business model. So first off, thank you so much for sharing that right up front. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, you're welcome. And it's a wonderful entree now to diving into the data that you're helping both your clients and Blue Box grow. So thank you. 
Yep, absolutely. So the box personalization in your business, really what we're, we're the focus of this, it's going to show you how to approach and personalize your own subscription box program. And like I said, I'm going to use examples from both Bulu Box and what we call our turnkey subscription box solutions. Um, this first stat, there it is right there. This is actually from a sub to publication. Um, and it's kind of, you know, when I look at this 86% of consumers admit personalization affects their purchase decision. Um, I'm going to say out of the gate, this is the number one discussion point that we have with our clients. So this isn't just um, subscription boxes um, from kind of an independent point of view um, are seeing this, but also major retailers and or other companies um, that decide to kind of launch their own subscription box program. So one thing that is interesting is that a lot of subscription boxes are all about discovery, right? It's surprise and delight. And at Bulu Box, we promise to introduce customers to these new exciting products. And in a way, personalization goes completely against the brand promise, right? It's like, hey, try all this new stuff that you don't know about. But people feel comfortable and they feel like personalization is what's for them. So right out of the gate, it's kind of not aligning with your own brand promise, right? Um, like you're, you're signing up for these products um, and you want to be exposed to new things, but it doesn't feel personalized because you might not like that flavor or you might not, you know, you, uh, kind of a caffeine pre-workout product or a melatonin product that helps you sleep might be scary to you and it doesn't feel personalized, but you don't realize that that's like the same reason that you went and purchased a surprise and delight box. So now like, don't get me wrong. There's a ton of levels to this. And I think that's really when we found with our clients and other people in this industry, uh, we always say like words, words matter, right? Now these words, whether you're saying tailored or customized or personalized, it's really important that you use the correct language and that you use that language throughout all of your marketing materials and communication. And furthermore, you start to graphically illustrate what that means, right? Um, and I'd say that that is the biggest challenge that our clients kind of end up falling into is everybody wants to say customized right away because that feels good or personalized, but then they don't deliver on that and customers get really frustrated and then they kind of think like man we should have said tailored or catered or, or whatever so hmm. words really matter the graphic illustration of those words really matter and your brand promise be careful that you're not going against kind of inherently what your company is so we spent a ton let's see if i can get to the next slide here there it is we spent a ton of money in 2014 and we did a huge customer survey. Um, we hired uh, data scientists, we had, our, uh, we had uh, economists, we had uh, teachers at the University of Nebraska, everybody kind of like reviewed this program. And it came down to uh, uh, our customer surveys said two things. Customers want a personalized box. They want to choose it, which furthermore basically said, they want to choose what they want. And the second thing was they wanted it cheap. So we actually didn't know how we were going to do this, but we thought, let's give people what they want and let's figure out how the kind of economics of it work later on. So we came up with this build your own Bulu box. And the idea was that the customers got to choose three samples for that month. Um, and our team would round out the other two or three samples because when it came to logistics and sample opportunities, et cetera, that made the most sense. We also sold it for $5. And I can't remember if we were breaking even or losing money, or I think when you layered on the kind of marketing, we we're actually losing money. But what we wanted to do was get 3,000 of those boxes out there and see what happens, right? So it was not branded as a test, it was branded as a launch. It went off without a hitch. We spent a ton of time, a ton of energy. We did exactly what people were asking for. And I'm going to share the results of those 3,000 people that signed up for this. Let me see if I can just get over to the next slide here. 
there it is. So we set out uh, a goal of actually 30% monthly churn after month one, which I will say you know, we could have a whole new conversation and presentation over churn. Uh, the goal of Boo Boo Box is actually to get customers to churn out of the box and into getting a full-size product of a multivitamin or a protein or a fish oil and get that on repeat delivery. So the whole you know, uh, churn model of the box um, is actually really high with Boo Box because we want to get them on repeat delivery of a full-size product. So we actually, in some cases, are pushing people out of the box and into a full-size sale. So for this project or this test, we set a goal of 30% monthly churn after month one. Hmm. But what happened was like way- Hey, more Paul. Yeah. I just want to pause. You said you targeted 30% churn. Yeah. That's powerful. I mean, I, I believe that in a world where, you know, people say, oh, you have to be below 5% or, okay. you know, 10% is unsustainable. Bullshit. What you did is you said strategically, you have a reason. And I just wanted us to pause and let that sink in. And I'm just curious before you move on here. Yeah. Did everybody agree with you in the company? Um, we, we have, you know, when we started the company, I think the lowest that churn was, was about 4% and then it climbed to 8%. And then kind of when the mass of, you know, competitors and, and just, you know, two or three years in, you know, churn just started going through the roof. And, you know, we had the economics of what the customer acquisition costs and lifetime value should be for that. Um, but, um, um, it was it was a it was a matter of how much money are you willing to spend to kind of get to um, the point that makes sense for uh, that churn. So I think so many times when I say, you know, it really is a whole nother presentation and a whole nother discussion. Um, what I have come to find out, and I have seen thousands of decks, is that what really matters is how you define the customer, how you define the customer acquisition cost how you define lifetime value, how you define churn. Um, I have seen very, very large subscription box folks define churn as literally an email being canceled. So they describe a, or, or, uh, describe a customer as an email that they acquire and an email that cancels off a list. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways that you can calculate churn. And for Blue Box, we just decided, um, hey, when we get somebody buying full size repeat versions of that product, the margin is much higher. They kind of set it and forget it. So why are we fighting and losing, mm -hmm. trying to get churn? And actually what happened was as the churn increased, we had always planned on selling full size products, but that just kicked it almost a full year in advance of we had to figure out selling full size products and a rewards point system. So, um, and, and then when you layer on the customer, the churn is much different if you layer them into a box and then into a full size repeat delivery of the product, then the churn starts to get lower. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a whole strategy and it just boiled down to like, why are we fighting what the, we're fighting the entire market and the only way to kind of fight with that is to either change the company or throw money at the problem. Um, why don't we evolve, right? Mm -hmm. Powerful. Thank you. Thank you for taking that detour with us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we did this, though, our churn was actually much higher, which I have 63%. Damn. That was a lot. That was way higher. So that was out of our range, and that would not work with the model that we were doing. Um, what we found with this is that customers would not, no matter that they said they wanted to try new things, we literally were watching, you know, we, we can do screen captures, I think Crazy Egg and some other, there's other software that allows you to watch like what customers do. And nobody, you know, it boiled down to like, nobody was logging in to select their products. When they did go to select their products, they were getting products that they already knew, you know, they were getting the chocolate proteins, the you know, the granola bars, the products that they always knew. Um, we literally stripped out kind of the whole surprise and delight element of the box, right? So 
Although on the surveys, and I know the data in the industry all points to, and you know, so I'm talking Subta, I'm talking Bulu Box, the clients that we work with, the number one, actually I'll say the number one complaint is always, when am I getting my box? And then the number two complaint is, why isn't this more personalized or how do I get it more personalized? Um, and I think the reality is that those things might just be what it is for some folks, especially if your brand promise is surprise and delight like it is for Bulu Box. So what we did actually learn and we, you know, we, we licked our wounds, we, we killed <laughs> the program really quickly. Um, there was a lot of, you know, apology emails and calls for the small amount of people that were actually using it. I think we just let it run for three months and almost everybody churned out eventually. Um, but what we learned is that our element and our brand of surprise and delight actually meant more to our, to our customers than selecting their own samples. Um, customers do not always know what they want. I think that's a big one. Um, and, and I think that's humans in general. We think we know what we want. Like we all want to work out, but are we actually gonna get up and go work out, right? Like we think we have a customized box, but are we gonna actually log in and, and choose the products? Um, and we also need to make sure that we trust our own brand promise and that we stick to what we know. But some other things that we did learn were some easy personalization tactics. Um, so one example is we do a predetermined Bulu box type. An example is we actually offer, even though if you sign up for a custom, if you sign up for a customer at Bulu box, the way that you answer questions about your profile, we will actually tailor the box for weight loss or standard strength gaining or other things. But when you give somebody the option to choose an original or a weight loss Bulu box, they feel empowered. So even though you're kind of software and back end, you're going to choose that for people based on what they answer in surveys. By letting them choose up front from a broader sense, people really enjoy, and, and our numbers went through the roof when we started to kind of like say original and weight, weight loss. So even though we were doing it on the back end and not saying anything, when we brought that up to the front and said, look, you can choose original or weight loss, people love that. And it felt like they were empowered a little bit more. Um, the, um, when I think of like different boxes, you know, other options could be like small breed or large breed dog or not kind of a range of artists, right? It's the questions that you likely will ask or you'll get to know your customer over, but letting them select those things, I think is really empowering for people. Um, gender being, you know, gender specific to people, um, making sure that those products are gender specific. It seems pretty basic, but I think a lot of people also miss that. Um, and over here for the best box experience, if you want to customize your box, all you have to do is fill out your interest. When you activate your account, the more you shop, the better we know what, what to give you in your box. With every purchase you make using your membership, we learn, or with every purchase you make losing, using your membership, we learn more about what you like, what cool new products will best suit your personal tastes and goals. And so we push a lot of that copy in emails when people go to sign up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and basically it's another way of saying, the more that you tell us and the more that you engage, the better we can kind of qualify the box for you. So Paul, can I interrupt here for a second? Back on that last slide. Thank yeah. you. Um, two items. I do want to remind our audience to ask any questions at any point in time. And I know Paul will be glad to drill down into the data as well and share the insights and learning. Uh, I do have a, a question and an observation as well. So one of the things that is fairly typical in a lot of discovery and delight boxes is that people gift certain of the items. And I had an experience because having received the Bulu box this last month as well, there was an item in there and it was a full size item is actually um, a different, it wasn't exactly melatonin, but it was something, it was a sleep aid and they were like, 20 or 30 pills in. So it was a very full size one. And I fall asleep extremely fast. <laughs> so that is not my issue. But I was talking to somebody in the office and they were sharing with me that their mother has a tremendous difficulty falling asleep. And I said, Oh, fantastic. Let me give this to you. And yeah. she was able to give it to her 
mother and use it and it was a great experience. So I don't know that people normally think of this product category as yeah. having giftable items, but I'd just love to hear what, what have you learned about that component of yeah. it as well? We call those the pass alongs. Um, okay. We used to um, put stickers on them. And so we would actually, you know, if you were going to get that product from Bulu Box and we kind of knew it wasn't a good fit or like we weren't sure or, and you'll see it a lot with, with sleep products because a lot of people think that they sleep fine and then they actually try it and they go, oh, whoa, that's what sleep is supposed to feel like a deep night sleep is supposed to feel like. Um, but we used to put stickers on them. Um, we don't do it anymore due to cost, um, but we will on occasion do an email or an insert and we kind of monitor customer complaints and if people are you know, frustrated a lot with like, hey, I didn't want this or, you know, hey, um, you sent me this female product and I'm a male or, or whatever it is, um, we'll respond both via email and we might like monitor the group as a whole and say, you know, just as a reminder, we're doing four to five um, samples in your box, but if you get extra ones or if you get a pass along one, like share, we, we call it share the health, <coughs> excuse me. Share the health, nice. The health. Yeah, yeah. So, but exactly what you said happens, happens. And um, yeah, I hope we can get back someday to putting stickers on those kind of uh, pass along products. Well, I know it was very appreciated, but now you have me second guessing. Maybe I should have kept it. <laughs> And I'd yeah. have even better nights of sleep. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, a lot of people, you know, they they don't understand how long caffeine is in their body for, and you know, they'll they'll take something with a little melatonin or five HT five HTP GABA and a different mix, and then they go, oh wow, this is that was a deep night's sleep, right? When you wake up and you don't remember what day that was. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I want to jump out of bed instead of just crawl. Wonderful, yep. thank you. Yep. So um, for the Bulu box, I think this is another, you know, this, um, I'm getting towards the end of, of what I'll share today, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, but I think a lot of this also, it's really important to understand that um, Bulu box sources items, and we, have, we do not pay for the items that we get. Um, and we're only able to do that because we established relationships and contracts a long time ago. Um, other companies, however, you know, most people pay cost for products or some companies actually own and have a big enough brand where brands will pay to be in their subscription box. So chew on that for a minute. Um, some subscription boxes are paying to get products. Some are getting them for free and others are getting paid to feature products in their box. And some are doing a little bit of all of that, right? Um, one interesting thing that happened last week was that a client came to us and um, we, had, we hadn't worked with them before and they said, you know, we're basically 150,000 boxes short. Uh, we need to basically find, facilitate and fulfill by Friday 150,000 boxes, um, which is not a good time frame at all. You know, typically we plan ahead six months with clients and figure out everything, but is a big client, big opportunity. We are familiar with kind of all the things that they're doing. So what we did is we went out and we were able to secure not only free products for the box, but actually we're able to get a bunch of brands to pay to be in the box, um, which the you know everybody was really excited about because we're able to do it on such a short time frame. But one of the issues that came up is that there was a, you know, they weren't the exact products that, you know, the client was looking for, which kind of then on my next slide, you'll see what the kind of big takeaway is from this is that you'll see here, and this is what we call our personalization spectrum. And this is for Blue Box. So for minimum personalization on the left and kind of maximum on the right, this is kind of an exercise that we go through with some of our clients and it's kind of simple but it when you look at it like this and like the next slide i have i think it really helps you wrap your head around it and communicate it a little bit better operationally it's pretty simple the more that you customize and personalize the slower and more expensive it's going to be to pack and ship right um so here's a few like touch points that you can look at and this is the example for blue box and you'll see that 
the price of Bulu Box is on the cheaper side, which you know kind of puts it more on the minima, uh, minimum personalization. Now on the sheer volume per delivery, you know, there's a real number in sacrifice um, that you kind of have to give up if you're gonna do those like massive numbers, right? Uh, because uh, some of our clients and some folks, it'll turn down to a sheer time constraint of getting the boxes out, even if you're packing morning, noon, and night. Um, the different versions of the boxes, I know when we started, uh, we wanted all of the Bulu boxes to be the same. Uh, we quickly found out that was not gonna be possible. So for Bulu box, we'll range anywhere from like eight to as high as 41 different variations, or I'm sorry, versions. And the more versions that you do, that's just gonna be a higher operational cost because you're kind of changing your fulfillment stations or fulfillment house around. Um, when you're asking for free products, you're gonna kind of get what's available in the market versus if you're paying for products, you can kind of go out and select you know, what's out there. And if you wanna get paid for products to put in your box, um, that is going to be more a negotiation of what somebody's willing to pay to put in the box. So there's all these kind of levers, right? And the last one is kind of discovery versus customization. Um, the one I think that does the best job of it is Stitch Fix. Um, they have great algorithms. They kind of have a great machine that you fill in social media, you fill in everything about yourself, and they kind of kick back close to you. I've been a subscriber of Stitch Fix for a very long time, and I will say, you know, they really hit the mark on me, and, and I, I try new products all the time. But every about third box that I get, it is just completely like what what are these clothes like I I specifically said I don't want white shirts or I don't want this or that so even a great company which I put stitch fix in the top tier of boxes um, they are at the mercy of some of the inventory that they have or they quite haven't figured out perfectly how it works and if you talk to people at stitch fix or you talk to people that subscribe to stitch fix you'll hear a lot of one or the other of they absolutely nailed it for me or yeah, I got a few good boxes, but then this one that's just like totally, you know, didn't make sense at all. And so even at that level, you're seeing kind of a, a fight of kind of, you know, we call it the good, fast and cheap, which brings me to my next. Okay. So Paul, Paul yeah. if you can go back to the personalization spectrum there, which is a fantastic way to illustrate, this, these different continuums. So if we can go back, yep. back, <laughs> there we go. I have one question from our viewers or our listeners. And then I also have one question myself in terms of the stitch fix model you were just mentioning. So one of the questions we have from the audience is how does this change based on your experience with different product categories overall? Yeah. Is there anything? Yeah. So we talk yeah. about that, please. Well, I would say, um, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be honest. The first thing that comes to mind is like clothes are so hard, <laughs> <laughs> man. Um, um, clothes are incredibly hard. Uh, we do not do any like fresh, fresh food. And it's because we went through this exercise, you know, kind of the blue aprons of the world and the hello fresh and anybody doing kind of, uh, perishable food. Um, we don't do that because when you look at it on the personalization spectrum, we just kind of um, wouldn't have the skill set or capacity. And when we look at the investment from kind of a warehouse and logistics point of view, that's a very specific thing. I would say the next most challenging is clothing because there's size and cuts and that's kind of its own beast. Um, and I would say that ultimately it is different for every, not only just the category of, you know, let's say makeup, vitamins and supplements, pet food, clothes, you name it, but it is different for kind of the um, um, category within that uh, vertical, if you will. Like, are you a surprise? Uh, I'll, I'll use us, for example. We are a sample surprise and discovery subscription box, um, which if I could go back and do it all again, 
I would probably do things a little bit differently, right? There's other vitamin and supplement boxes out there that focus more on, they just want to get you a repeat delivery of the same products with like one new thing. Um, kind of think, you know, more of like a Harry's rate, or I'm sorry, a Dollar Shave Club, right? Mm -hmm. They just want to get you the razor and get you the refill. So that's kind of like a auto refill type program. So the answer is yes, it is different for every single category, but even on a deeper level, going down to the brand promise. Um, and I think the important thing is you have to focus on your brand promise and the whole, which I have on this next slide, if any of you have ever heard the saying, good, fast, and cheap, pick two, you can't have all three, right? If any, anybody probably heard that, heard that saying. Um, well, when I was at General Motors, that was a very common topic when I was working with our manufacturers and suppliers. Yes. Because of course, everybody wanted it good, fast, but we would, we would consider good quality. Yes. So high quality, cheap, and fast and you can't have all exactly. three and i would time. say yep i would say um you know the the kind of middle spectrum so we say personalized cheap and high volume and this is kind of like our version of that when we work with our clients and, and talk with them through these things um this middle part um where i say does this even exist right here it, I think it does, but it's in the form of burning money and losing profit, right? So if you're mm -hmm. cool and if you're okay with the box and Blue Apron, again, is an example that comes to mind or Dollar Shave Club, you know, these companies have, they literally spend hundreds of millions of dollars and they have zero dollars in profit, right? And that's okay because their goal is to grow their customer base and to leverage that in the future to make money. So, you know, um, I would say that it is possible to be in the middle, but you need to be ready to raise hundreds of millions of dollars in capital and kind of throw it all at those things. And then, you know, just basically you're getting customers to make money off later. So when we look at these three categories, personalized kind of means that each box is tailored to the unique preferences of the customer. Cheap means that customers can sign up for it at a low price. Um, and high volume means that thousands of boxes or tens of thousands of boxes are now, you know, we've seen hundreds of thousands of boxes in weeks or a week um, are what you're kind of dealing with, right? And so you can see each category here, this is time consuming and expensive for your company to produce. It requires a higher price point. This is slightly more expensive for your company to produce, but there's a higher perceived value. And there's a more affordable for your company and for the customer, but there's a low perceived value, right? So I'd say Bulu Box is probably playing in this space specifically. And I would say a lot of our clients are kind of playing in this space right here. Or And, and I'd say I haven't seen a ton of people in this, but I think you really get in trouble when you try to like accomplish all of these things. Um, Paul, yeah. I have a question. You are referring to this, and I do not believe we can see what you are referring to with this. You're probably zooming your mouse around, but we don't know what the this is. There, there I can see your mouse. So if you can, I saw your mouse briefly, but if you can just describe where on this quadrant, north, south, east, west, you were uh, referring to, we yeah. missed that part. Gotcha, so I would say Bulu Box is living in the high volume and cheap space, right? Um, we have some level of personalization and customization, but because we're doing free, we're requesting free products from clients, um, we're at the mercy of the market. Um, we see a lot of um, brands that we work with, they're doing high volume and personalized. Um, and the box itself is then usually co-funded from marketing or it's part of another program or it's expensive to kind of purchase right um so i have a question paul about yeah. the type of so wonderful so i now understand where bulu box which is kind of in that light greenish area yeah and now the companies that you're describing that are time consuming and expensive for the company to produce i'm curious are they making money yes but i would say that they are making money some of them are making money off of the box but I would say a lot of them are kind of, you know, following the customer over a long-term timetable and seeing the positive impact that the box has 
um, you know, not just within products in the box, but just within the customer in general, right? So that, that could possibly be for other companies where they have other channels that the customer can purchase from. So this is part of their marketing toolkit, perhaps. Exactly. And I think that's hmm. so important to understand, like, where, where does your box live? Is it an R&D tool? Where does your box live? Yeah. Is it an R&D tool? Is it a marketing tool? Is it the actual product itself, right? Is, is, are you actually trying to sell a box and make a profit off of it? Um, which I think that space is really challenging right now because of uh, just the sheer competition. Um, so I think, you know, where does your box live? Marketing, R&D, um, or is it the actual product? And there's, you know, kind of combinations of all of those things. I would say though, everybody, and this is including us, and we still fall into the trap of, we try to be good, fast, and cheap, or highly personalized, cheap, and high volume. And um, that's just a constant kind of, you know, um, kind of topic that you have to review and kind of realign people and get everybody on the same page. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. So here's my big takeaway. Don't F up like we did. <laughs> Understand what you're promising your customers. Um, test, 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 don't change things. Um, I'm so, you know, we lost our asses on BYOB. Uh, BYOBB, the whole kind of customer selecting what they wanted. Um, it was still a test and we lost a lot of money on it. Uh, words matter, personalized, customized, tailored, and the graphics that go with them. Um, let your end goal be your guide, not just churn, right? Like, what are you really trying to do? What do you really want the customer to do? And don't panic about the churn because you still might be able to get people there in another way. Uh, do not try to be something that you're not, right? So just because Stitch, uh, Stitch Fix or uh, Loot Crate, uh, hey, Loot Crate out there if you're watching, um, uh, Blue Apron, Dollar Shave Club, Birchbox, Ipsy, uh, Barkbox, just because one of the big kind of brands in our space um, are doing it doesn't mean that that's what you should be doing. Uh, so don't try to be something that you're not. Whole good, good, fast, cheap, pick two, or we call it personalized high volume and cheap, pick two. You can't have all three unless you have a couple hundred million in capital. Um, and I think most importantly, customer surveys don't always equal subscriber sales. And I think that this quote kind of sums it up nicely. And I know Henry Ford probably didn't actually say this, but it's the point of the quote. <laughs> and it's, uh, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And that's the quote from Henry Ford. And um, I know that Steve Jobs is a similar quote, right? Um, if you would have asked people what they wanted, you know, it would have never been a computer or an iPhone. They had to kind of like come up with that and provide it to the market and, and get there um, in a different way. So I think that's the big takeaway for us, what we've seen not only doing this you know, over five years, maybe even six years for Boo Box, and now servicing uh, other turnkey subscription box solution clients and shipping probably about 5 million boxes next year is surveys are super important. Listen to your client, all of those things. But, um, you know, you need to do your box and your brand. And if you just listen to customers, sometimes they're not going to actually tell you what they want. Pa. Thank you. If you can go. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I do have a question from the audience as well as I have um, a question that your last slide prompted me to say. So if you wouldn't mind, this is always the tricky part. Yes. Ah, so smooth. Thank you very much, Paul. Is going back to this slide. One of the things that I always wonder is I would imagine if Henry Ford were to do that survey, what he might have learned is that people wanted to get places faster. And if you ask them how to solve, they would say faster horses. Yes. So this brings me back to, I think the power of research is actually as a starting point, not as an end point. And I think people look for end point type of answers out of it. Tell me what to do. But that's what, that's what we're all paid the big bucks for, right? Is to figure yeah. out what the solution is. So yeah. I think rather is diving into understanding what the pain points are. People wanted to get you know, from point A to B quicker 
because it took too long or whatever. So that being the case of a needs orientation, I'm curious, how might you nowadays, and thank you so much for taking us on this journey, you know, the highs and the lows, what kinds of needs are you seeing that you're trying to perhaps fulfill with future Bulu Box business models? Yeah, so uh, the needs for some of our future clients, is that what you're, the question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say that um, in general right now, and I, I would say this isn't really the client, just clients, but this is kind of everybody, and I, I feel questions all the time about this, um, is it's like, what is what is the what is the model right like what is this what is the perfect subscription box model and i think everybody is trying to figure out or refine that and you know the the answer is what we figured out the closest thing to it is that there's a few key parts that you know hold true to like monthly recurring revenue a shipment of a box the weight matters the kind of products on the inside matter. But when we go down and we break out for our clients all of the considerations, we have anywhere from 100 to 180 different lines um, in an Excel sheet that they have to consider for their product. And I think that there's a few things that hold the standard for subscription boxes across the board. And that's why you know a lot of the discussions are like, how much does a cardboard box cost you? And should I print on the inside and outside? And there's those things. But I think on a much deeper level, those, you know, we'll say a hundred additional lines on Excel, people are either figuring out the hard way or they never ever figure out to ask those things. And I think that overall people are just saying, what I'm hearing from the market right now is, okay, subscription boxes are a thing. Um, the people are signing up for them. Um, customers are there but how does it work? And everybody wants kind of this cookie cutter model mm. and, and it doesn't exist. The reality is there's a few things that are common across the board, but there's a hundred variables. And just one of those variables is like, does the customer actually want this? You know, which like seems so basic and so, you know, um, such an obvious thing, but I can't tell you how many times a big research firm or an ad agency or whoever works with a client and they actually come to us with a deck and they say, you know, here's what we figured out with the client or what this entity or, or, you know, here's my business plan for my new subscription box. And you just look at it. And like the first question is, do you think your, do you think your target actually wants this? And they go, well, I, I don't know. And that hesitation is actually them saying no. And then you kind of dig a little bit more and then you find out like, oh, what really this started off is, is somebody liked the monthly recurring revenue stream in an Excel document, right? And that's what it started off as. And so I think that's the big thing is like to be able to get logistics and operations and finance and marketing and whether it's a brand new box or somebody else trying to do it, um, the how and those kind of hundred different variables all have to be done. And then at the end of it, you have to say, do customers really actually want this thing? And I think if anybody went to like my subscription addiction and looked at all the boxes on there, you know, you'd probably look at things and go like, you know, is there a market for this or does that market, does somebody really actually want that box? Right. Which that's my, my shout out to, uh, MSA for you my friends over at my subscription addiction. So um, I think that's a really basic thing that people miss. Um, I also think that the market of um, what we're seeing with customers is due to competition, a lot of customers aren't willing to pay much for a box, right? Um, and I don't think that will always be the case. I think that over time, a lot of people are, you know, a lot of companies are going to consolidate or go in a different direction. It's actually, in my research, really similar to the external hard drive market. There was a few in the beginning. It ballooned up to over 10,000 companies. And then at the end, there's only three or four of them. And you can kind of look at magazines like Hearst and Condé Nast and American Media all the same way. And I think that's what will happen with subscription boxes. 
but right now we're kind of in this space where there's a lot of people doing it and customers are smart and they're taking advantage of all the discounts and stuff. So price does matter right now. And to try to make a profit off of the box for right now in this kind of time frame, it's really challenging to make a good profit off the box because there's just so many variables that, you know, can get screwed up or, or not be accounted for and like, boom, your profit's gone. So, Paul, I have a couple questions that have come in. One is from Jeff. He wants to know, what do you think of the Amazon sample box program? They stole our damn idea. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's a, it's funny cause I think one of, they have a uh, supplement sample box. Um, I think literally we had a box named healthy discoveries or whatever, and they have the same thing. So, uh, what do I think of it? Um, Amazon, you have to figure out how to work with them. Um, so they have a platform, I think it's public now. Um, you can sell, uh, uh, it's, uh, you better, uh, we'll put it this way. Y you better figure out how you're going to deal with Amazon. And I think you can join them or you can, you know, uh, get slowly eaten alive by them, or you can go try to start a Amazon competitor. Um, and I think for the longest time we fought Amazon uh, because our simple thinking was, no, we want them to come to our website. Um, but as we've slowly started to layer, you know, I think we sell like limited edition Bulu boxes. We do work for clients on Amazon. Um, it's actually, you know, it ends up being more profitable in the end when you work with Amazon versus trying not to. So it's a necessary thing. Excellent. Thank you for commenting on that. Question for you. You were mentioning how you see the industry where it started expansion, consolidation. I always believe life is a series of expansion, expansion, consolidation. But I have a question. Do you believe that the subscription box industry overall can take on a little bit more of the reflection of Main Street America as well? And I, I mentioned that, and it takes lessons learned from whether it's department stores, retailers, whoever, is that in most environments, there will always be the big players who are the enterprise organizations, but that there's also room for the mom and pop shops, whether that's your favorite um, coffee house down the street, that sometimes you don't wanna do the Starbucks, right? And I think of some of our yeah. mom and pop, Main Street America, you know, they might only wanna sell oh. 100 to 200 of the best jerky from Southern Texas you could ever get. Talk to that because I think subscription has the beauty because of the distribution channel and because of the ability to connect with experiences to represent Main Street America as well. Curious what you think. Yeah, so I think there's absolutely a, a, a place for different variations of the boxes. Um, and I think when I'm thinking of the boxes, I'm thinking of those companies that are typically shipping like over, you know, we'll say um, a couple hundred thousand boxes a year, right? Like what's going to happen to those is that they're going to, you know, probably be consolidated or rolled up. So for people that are shipping, I'll just say a quarter of a million boxes or more a year. I think that's kind of what will happen to those. Um, but when it comes to like hyper local or hyper customization or probably focusing on, you know, we had personalized high volume and cheap, probably the more focused on one of those categories that you become, there's absolutely like a space to live, right? Like there's always going to be a, a Nebraska subscription box that I want to send to my friends for three to six months, right? Um, there's, a, I think, a Michigan one too as well, right? The mi yes, the mitten. Yeah, yeah. And the, the what's it called? A mitten crate. Nice. You know, we're, you know the mitten? Yep. Mitten crate. Yep. Nice, yep. So there's always going to be a place for those. Um, and I also think, you know, like, yay, capitalism, like if there's something you want to take over or go after, like you have the ability to do that. And, you know, raising capital is one quick way to do that. So like, you know, there's a dollar shave club, but there's no reason that somebody couldn't raise capital and do a better dollar shave club. Like, you know, Harry's is kind of trying to do, or, um, somebody couldn't do a different variation of that. I think what's going to happen now is we'll see kind of more of a prolific change of, there will be really big brands and then there will be really 
smaller kind of, or I'll say really big brands doing boxes. And then there's going to be smaller premium limited quantity boxes. And I think everything in between is going to either, they got to pick kind of which route that they want to go. And I, but I don't think that will happen for a while, but I think eventually similar to retail, you know, really it's turning into you're either the cheapest or you have the best location for retail and everything in between, including Target, are struggling to find their place. And so I think it's just going to be more of a drastic change. And so you got to pick kind of one or the other. Do you want to go and become a huge, giant, you know, big branded box? Or do you want to be kind of more of a premium, expensive, you know, that and kind of everything in the middle might, you know, not... And I would actually throw Blue Box in that category too. Like we got to figure out kind of what the future for that is, but we don't have to figure that out in the next you know year. So Paul, I want to, as we wrap up here in the power hour, and one of the things we try and encourage everybody with the power hour is we try and end about 15 minutes before the hour so our audience can take what they've heard, take what they've learned and actually find one actionable item that they're going to do something about because frequently we all go from meeting to meeting to meeting and don't get an opportunity to figure out how we're going to make it actionable. So I would, I would encourage everybody to do that with the remaining 10 minutes they have. And Paul, I know you've given us a lot to chew on and I really appreciate what you shared. I have one last question for you is, did you have any last salvo you would like to share with the group about anything you've talked about or learned? You know, I think that the, kind of it's it's at the end of the day i think the main thing is the good faster cheap pick two you can't pick all three and that's okay right um and customers are always going to kind of have something that they want um and i think you know something that you could do better i think at the end of the day and this sounds so simple but go order a box for yourself from your company and then go have one of your trusted friends or family members order a box from your company and get it and just meet back up and talk about everything from the experience to delivery. And that simple action like will tell you so much. It's something that people just forget to do, but go get your own box under a different name so nobody knows who you are and then have a trusted friend do it. And that will tell you a lot, probably more about your company than you'll ever learn at like a webinar like this. So, Paul, in other words, eat, eat your own dog food. There you go. <laughs> so, thank, thank you so much. First off, thank you to our audience who tuned in and future listeners as well. I'm sure you found it as helpful as I did the insights Paul shared. And, Paul, you and your team play fearless each and every day, and I think you really embody the spirit of what this industry is about, which is getting out there, trying new things, and changing how people shop, learn, and discover new products. So, Thank you very much for being with us today, and we are out. <laughs>